Good afternoon, guys. Um, I'm going to be picking up with where we left off with making bombs for Hitler. And we finished chapter 10. Um, Lida had just decided instead of, um, she just did all that wonderful embroidery work for Inge on those fancy clothes that her husband sent her. And Inge wanted to reward her in some way. So she gave her, um, she was going to give her part of her sandwich with all the meat and, um, Lida decided that she would prefer to have a new dress, um, so that she could give it to, um, Xenia because she was injured and it kind of tore her dress to tatters. So she ended up getting like an old, like long kind of shirt and she ended up being able to take pieces of that and every girl in Barrack 7 was able to get a piece of the fabric. And um, my question for you guys was that, um, my question for you guys was, uh, what would you have cho uh, chosen? Would you have picked the sandwich or um, having the new dress? And um, some of you guys responded, most of you guys responded that you would pick um, the clothing because it was needed and um, that everybody was able to get something from that. So it, it benefited the the mini and not just Lida. So that was, that was very um, generous of her and not being selfish at all when she could have had that delicious sandwich. So we're going to pick up from here. Uh, her last part was she was um, sleeping and she thought she dreamed that um, Luca had come in and kissed her on the forehead and told her to um, be safe, little sister. So let's see what happens. Chapter 11, Roll Call. The next day at Roll Call, several pr prisoners complimented the girls of Barrack 7 on our nice clothing. It thrilled me to see everyone look so happy. Officer Schmidt made us all stand at attention for longer than usual. It was drizzling rain and we each stood rigidly. My feet ached from the damp. The rain didn't bother Officer Schmidt, though. A soldier scampered behind him as he walked, holding a huge black umbrella over his head. My new blue dress was soaked through and every bone in my body ached. I was looking forward to drying out in the laundry. Officer Schmidt walked up and down our rows, examining each of us carefully, making note of the new patchwork. When he got to Xenia, he stopped. Your dress. Where did you get it? Xenia lowered her eyes and looked at her muddy feet. A friend gave it to me. He grunted. He continued his inspection. When he got to me, he stopped again. Nice dress, little seamstress, he said. That one shirt went far. Why didn't you keep the whole thing for yourself? My mouth refused to form words. Officer Schmidt continued to stand in front of me. Speak up, he said. It makes me happy to share, I blurted. Then the officer did something that shocked me. He smiled. He rested one finger on my shoulder and said, You are getting a little bit too comfortable in the laundry. You have a new assignment. He reached into the depths of his uniform and pulled out an Osterbiter identification paper. He handed it to me, saying, Today, you go on the train. You will need this. It was the first time I had seen my own identification paper. I knew from the other girls that we were supposed to have them with us at all times if we left the compound. Getting caught without papers could mean death. Since I had always worked inside the complex itself, Officer Schmidt had never given my OST paper to me before. I folded the paper quickly and slipped it into my dress pocket to keep it relatively dry. I was devastated that he was moving me. Inge treated me well now and it was so pleasant in the laundry. To go into the city was something I dreaded. It was bombed regularly, after all. Officer Schmidt read out a list of newly assigned laborers, including Xenia, and told us that the policemen on the train would have the listings of our new jobs. A whistle shrilled as the train approached the gates. You're dismissed, shouted Officer Schmidt. I stood in the long line to get on the train. 
There were two policemen under a lamp post at the gate. One ticked off people's names on his clipboard as they passed him. The other stood with a rifle casually leaning against his shoulder. When it was my turn, the policeman's brow crinkled. You've not traveled to work before. What is your name? Lida Farazuk. I took out my identification paper and showed it to him. He scanned the list of names on his clipboard. Ah, he said. He pointed to a train car that was four units down. That's the one for you. I walked along a well-used path beside the tracks until I got to the correct train car. I was expecting it to be a cattle car like the one we arrived in, but this car had two rows of wooden benches and an aisle down the middle. Most of the seats had already been taken, and as I looked around for a place to sit, I was surprised to see regular people in the car, a gray-haired civilian in his, with his coat unbuttoned, revealing paint-splattered overalls, a plain-looking woman with her hair twisted in a bun, wearing a feathered green hat that looked like it was meant for someone else. Beside her sat a young girl whose blonde curls spilled, over, spilled out over her blue sweater. That girl reminded me so much of Larissa that I had to look away before I began to weep. Lida, here, Xenia's voice. I scanned the car. There she was, sitting near the back by herself. Across the aisle from her sat Katarina and Natalia. Mary, the schoolgirl I had thought was a teacher, sat in front of her with an older laborer whose name I didn't know. I made my way down the aisle and sat beside Xenia, setting my bowl, cup, and spoon in my lap. After having an assignment away from the others for so long, it was a nice change to be with some people I knew. All the girls in my barracks, of all the girls in my barracks, I liked Xenia the best. We'll be together, I said. Won't that be wonderful? Xenia regarded me, one brow arched. There's no such thing as wonderful here. You're right, Xenia, but I am still looking forward to working with you. Yes, that's a good thing. Let's just hope our new jobs aren't too difficult. The last to get to the compartment were the last to get to the compartment were two policemen. One of them stepped inside and slid the door shut, and the policeman outside bolted it. The train, sh the train shuddered and screeched, and soon we were speeding away. I watched out the window, hungry for a view of something that wasn't surrounded by barbed wire. The train stopped at stations along the way, and I watched through the window as policemen with clipboards would approach the train. The laborers would be herded out, and a policeman from the train would give a sheet of paper to a policeman at the station, who clipped it to his board and checked off the workers one by one. Some of them were loaded into the backs of trucks, and others walked in single file, led by a German in civilian clothing. Zini had been traveling this route for some time, who are those people taking the laborers away? I asked her. Factory owners, quarry managers, business owners, she replied. I thought we were forced to work for the Nazis. These businessmen pay the government for the privilege of using us, replied Zena bitterly. Zenia bitterly. I am sure they find it quite a convenience to have slaves. Her comment made me wonder what these regular Germans thought about us. Did they think we had done something wrong and were being punished? Or did they even know that their government captured people from other countries and made them work for Germany? As our train idled at a later stop, we watched as a cluster of near-dead men who wore yellow stars on their striped rags were forced into the back of a truck by a soldier with a club. We were being treated terribly, but one glance told us that these Jewish people had it even worse. Were they even fed at all? I was so grateful that no one at the camp realized that Xenia was Jewish. I glanced at her now and saw that her eyes had a faraway look. Was she thinking of her dead parents? A shiver ran down my back as if someone had stepped onto my grave. Our stop was the last. The whole time I had been on the train, I hadn't heard the sound of bomber planes overhead. It wasn't because they had stopped, but because the train's chugging was so loud. As soon as I stepped outside, the familiar high-pitched whine of American bombs was all I could hear. The ground trembled when one hit, and I would see a puff of smoke in the near distance. It didn't matter how often I heard the bombs. I could never get used to them. I stepped in line behind Mary and waited to be processed. 
The sun was shining over the top of a mountain range in the distance. These sharp gray rocks were nothing like our mountains back home. Ours had gentle rolling slopes covered with trees and grass. These jutted up to the heavens like weapons. As I waited in line, I felt the folded ridges of my identification papers in, paper in my pocket. I could not lose this. I pulled it out for the first and for the first time took a good look at the photograph. Was that really me? It was less than a year ago, but I looked so young and innocent. Aside from the whip slash on my face, the shaved head and the bug bites, I had looked almost healthy. I put my hand up to my cheekbone where the cut had been. The wound had closed over, but the skin was so thin that I could feel each of my teeth. I put my hand up to my hair. It was longer now, but standing up in tufts. Washing it with the harsh bleaching powder and cold water was essential to keep the lice away, but it burned my scalp and matted my hair. The paper was snatched out of my hand. I looked up. The policeman. You are Lida Farazuk? I nodded. He found my name on his list and put a check mark beside it. You go over there to Frau Zenger, he said. He pointed with his pencil to a woman in a tailored blue suit. I tried not to stare at her, but it was hard not to. First of all, the only other women at the train station were either frumpy looking mothers with children or slave laborers. I could tell by the cut of this woman's suit that it was custom made to show off her narrow waist. The material was expensive, I suspected it was a fine woven wool from England. Mama once had a customer who got her clothing from England and she would bring it in to us for alterations. Frau Zanger's outfit reminded me of that woman's. The policeman showed the woman his clipboard and together they ran through our names. Katerina, Xenia, Mary, Natalia, a woman I didn't recognize named Bibi, and me. Very good, Frau Zanger said in German but it was with an unfamiliar accent. And you're sure these all have steady hands? The policeman flipped through the pages in his clipboard. He pointed to one name. They both looked up at Xenia, who had removed the bandages on her arm, but the scratches were still vivid. I don't know why they gave you one who was injured. If she's not any good, I'll just get rid of her. Yes, ma'am. I do know that these six were all hand-selected for you. Should I load them up? Yes, Hans, I'll meet you at the factory. She walked up a long black car. She walked up to a long black car that was idling beside the train station. A uniformed man jumped out of the driver's seat and ran to the back door on the opposite side, opening it wide just as she got to it. He closed her door once she stepped in, then got back in and sped away. The policeman loaded the six of us onto the open back of a pickup truck. The truck, bed, the truck bed was wet with rain and there were no benches, so we had no choice but to sit down in the puddles. We huddled together with Xenia in the middle to keep her from falling on her scratches as we were driven away from the station. What had we been hand-selected for? As we were driven through the busy, the busy city streets, I could not see a single building that had been untouched by bombs. I watched in awe as we passed a husband and wife sipping tea at a kitchen table in a second floor flat. Only the flat had no walls and no ceiling. Below them, the building was in rubble as well. I guess they were thankful to at least have a kitchen. Since I'd arrived at camp, I'd hardly heard the American and British bombs going off. I'd heard the Brit British and American bombs going off nonstop. But listening to bombs in the distance was quite different from witnessing the damage close up. I knew we were in more danger here in the city, but I was exhilarated to see that the Nazis weren't doing so well. How I longed for the war to be over. Then I could find my sister and we could both go home. The driver maneuvered around fallen stonework from a bomb church, which sent us careening to one side in the back of the truck. I tried to keep Xenia upright, but when I lost my balance, she landed painfully on her injured arm. I watched clean, well-fed men and women wearing decent working, decent clothing, walking along the sidewalks, stepping through bomb fragments of lumber, stone, and brick. Looking at them made me feel dirty and insignificant. None of them seemed to notice us at all. I guess they had gotten used to seeing truckloads of scrawny laborers passing by. 
The truck pulled up to the entrance of a large U-shaped building made of yellow brick. It seemed to have miraculously escaped most of the air raids, although an outbuilding was nothing more than fresh rubble of twisted metal. The large arched windows of the main building had all shattered and were boarded up by wood. Shards of glass still hung from parts of the framework like jagged teeth. I suspected that damage was just from the ground shaking rather than a direct bomb hit. Oh no, said Xenia. I was hoping to be assigned somewhere else. This is the metalworks factory that was just bombed, I asked. I was working in there. She pointed to the flattened out building. What part of this factory would we be working in? How long would it stay standing? I had heard that factory buildings were magnets for bombs. It's safer than you think, Xenia said, reading the look of fear in my eyes. The main building has been marked on the roof with the symbol for hospital, and it has largely escaped the bombing. I bet my building got hit by mistake. The policeman opened up the back of the truck. We got out, and he ushered the six of us through the front entrance. I was grateful to be in a dry place, but I wish I were back at the laundry. We stood in a reception area. To one side was a glassed-in office with a large double-sided desk. Two healthy-looking blonde women faced each other, one pecking at a typewriter with two fingers, while the other tackled forms one by one, filling them out with a pen. Frau Zanger had one hand clasped around the knob of a battered wooden door that stood beside a larger door. She was having a heated conversation with a woman in a wraparound white smock. The woman's head was bowed respectfully, but her hands were clenched at her side. Frau Zanger stabbed one finger in our direction and said to her, I don't care how much other work you need to do, you will train these workers now. Then she turned to us. In there, all of you, she snapped. She opened the door and ushered the supervisor and us up the stairs and into a wire mesh second floor catwalk. She didn't follow us. Down below, we could see the metalworks factory as the day shift came in and the night shift shuffled out. Although we were a flight above the machines, we were still enveloped in mechanical thrumming, banging, clanging, and grinding. Even the wood floor of the walkway vibrated. I looked down at one contraption that had a huge sledgehammer device on a swinging arm. I watched the laborer at that station place a piece of metal down on a flat tray. The mechanized sledgehammer slammed down, turning the metal piece into the shape of a small bowl. As the sledgehammer rose again, the worker swept the stamped bowl onto a conveyor belt and placed the next piece of metal in the same spot on the tray. It seemed to me that it would be easy to have a finger or a hand on the tray at the wrong time, yet the worker was using her bare hands. The force of that sledgehammer would send bits of metal into her, could send bits of metal into her face, even her eyes. I guess it didn't matter to the owners. The metal bowls traveled down the conveyor belt, where they were picked up by women operating machines with spinning stone wheels. As they smoothed and ground the sides of the metal bowls, they were enveloped in a cloud of dust. Xenia was in front of me as we walked single file behind the supervisor. Was that your job before, I asked? pointing at the grinding machines. That's what I was doing, but in the outbuilding, we were working with a different shaped metal, she said. Other machines produce cylindrical pieces of metal, some as long as my arm. The laborers looked almost like machines themselves, except for their gaunt appearance and their exhaustion. When we walked the length of the factory, we followed the German supervisor through another door into a low ceilinged white room. It had a wooden table with attached benches at one end and an open tiled area with a long metal trough for washing at the other. A small pail of bleaching powder was hooked onto one of the taps. There was a single flush toilet off to one side. Put your eating utensils on the table, she said. You will wash your arms and hands carefully and then I will inspect you. We did as we were told I used the dreaded bleaching powder sparingly, but the water was gloriously hot. Xenia washed her scrapes gingerly with the stinging powder. Her left hand was slightly swollen, but she seemed to have good control over her fingers. I hoped that the supervisor would deem her useful. 
When we were finished, we lined up in a row, our hands dripping water as we stood at the edge of the tiled area. Hold them out, she ordered. She inspected the palms of our hands first, then turned each one, examining our fingernails closely. You pass, you pass, you pass. My hands were clean enough, so I stood to one side. Bibi was wearing a wedding ring. This must come off, said the woman. The ring was loose on Bibi's finger, and I was surprised that she had managed to keep it for so long. Madam Manager, she said, blinking back tears. I have never removed this ring. It is all I have left of my husband. I don't want your ring, said the woman. For your own protection, there can be no metal in the room you'll be working in. Leave the ring on the table with your eating utensils. Might someone steal it just sitting there? asked Bibi. The other workers do not come into this area, said the woman. When she got to Xenia, she made a clicking noise with her tongue. How do you expect to work with swollen fingers? Xenia opened and closed her fingers on her left hand. My hand works just fine, she said. The woman shook her head in disgust. Why did they even send you to me? Couldn't they find anyone better than a half cripple? I am one of the bomb survivors, said Xenia. If you ask Foreman Leech Slater, he will tell you what a good worker I am. Leech Slater did not survive the attack, said the supervisor. I'll give you a try. Her eyes landed on Xenia's neck. That cross is metal. Take it off. Xenia drew the leather strap over her neck and placed my precious cross on the table. The woman led us through the next door into yet another white room, this one empty, save for the table stacked with clean gray smocks. You will notice that these smocks have no metal snaps or clips and no dangling belts. They're washed daily and they wrap around you and tie at the back. <coughs> it is important that they are worn snugly, but your laborer badges must still be visible. Do any of you have metal on your clothing? She examined each girl's dress looking for snaps, zippers, or metal clips, but none of us had any. She gave each of us a square of gray cloth. You wear this over your hair. She took out an extra one and said to Xenia, hold out your arm. Then she expertly covered Xenia's injury. Where was it that we were working? We were in a factory, yet we were being prepared as if for a hospital. The supervisor checked her pocket and pulled out a pen with a metal tip and set it on the table. One last chance, she said. If you have any metal, take it off now. She looked at us with one eyebrow arched. None of us had anything else to give her. She ushered us into the next room. And that's the end of chapter 11. So our next chapter will be chapter 12, which I will pick up with on Monday. Make sure to check the Facebook group or remind for the response question for this chapter. Have a great weekend.